Good, I feel like I always start recording with uh, me in the middle of taking a sip of something. So, welcome to tonight's video lecture. Um, I've got a uh, fancy new microphone, so hopefully the quality is better um, for you guys. Uh, let me know. I, I couldn't really tell when I did a test thing earlier whether it was better. I think it's better. Um, but let me know. Um, if it's too... Can You guys can hear me fine with it where it's at, right? No weirdness. Sweet. Okay, awesome. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to talk about. So tonight's going to be kind of a lot of me talking probably, also to just kind of explain things. But as always, please interrupt with questions whenever you want. Uh, I think things are better when those kinds of things are happening. I was really enjoying how things were happening uh, today in class this morning where it was kind of like, back and forth the whole time, That's that's that really works. So uh, keep those comments coming. Um, feel free, again, like we kind of did last time, feel free to use the microphone, like to unmute yourself and say something with the microphone. Uh, that's totally cool. Uh, it's kind of cool I can see you, Daniel. So if you were like, hey, then I'd know like you want to speak. Yeah, like that. Yeah, then it's like raising a hand, then I can know. Uh, but otherwise, um, you know, you can interrupt me and that's fine uh, with the audio thing. Don't just like there's a pause. Otherwise, I'll kind of keep going. So <laughs> feel free to stop me whenever you want to say something. Um, and we were actually discussing things a little bit before uh, I started recording. And there's one thing I wanted to mention kind of to everybody. So uh, it has to do with how we're going to test these theories. And um, tonight I'm going to go through some of the arguments uh, that are the objections to some of the options, the theoretical options we've got for how to understand personal identity. And a lot of them have to do about knowledge, but we have to be really careful about uh, what role we're giving to our ability to know things related to personal identity. In other words, a good theory of personal identity won't be, it won't require, it's not like it's a necessary condition for a good theory of personal identity that we're capable of knowing whether we are the same person or not, or whether someone else is or not. It might be that what personal identity consists in is something that doesn't allow us to have that knowledge. But that's fine for the theory. Most metaphysical theories work like this, that they just give us the conditions for what it would mean for this thing to be happening, not necessarily the parameters for how we could know it. Okay, So this is the distinction between metaphysics and epistemology. Epistemology is about knowledge. And metaphysics is just about these existence claims. And we might say, well, what are we going to believe about what exists except on the basis of what we're able to know? And there's something to that. But there's also other things. Like, for instance, let me, let me kind of give you a, a silly example. I think I might have used this example before, but it illustrates the point very well. Take the claim that there are aliens on Alpha Centauri who like Nicolas Cage movies. Do you know whether that's true or false? I don't know whether that's true or false. But I know what the claim is saying. I know what it would mean for it to be true, and I know what it would mean to be false. That's more the level on which metaphysics happens, about what would it mean for this to be true or false. What are the phenomenon that are possible? Whether I know whether they're actually happening is not really the point. It's not like in order for me to understand the meaning of the statement, uh, there are aliens on Alpha Centauri, it's not like I would have to be able to know whether there are aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies in order for me to be able to understand the sentence. So that's the same thing with personal identity. All we want to understand is what would it mean to be the same person? And there might be actual cases where we just don't know. We don't know whether the person is the same or not, but we know what it would mean for them to be the same or for them to not be the same. That's more of what we're focused on. Um, is that making sense? This is kind of a subtle point uh, about metaphysics and philosophical debates about metaphysics and the standards that we're holding them to. Um, going so far, good, yeah? Cool. All right. Um, so keep that in mind as we're like exploring things. Um, we always like to have knowledge. There might be some things we don't have knowledge about, but we can still talk about what they would mean. For example, like uh, let's let's just say it's granted for the sake of argument. I think that it is true, but let's there might be some controversy over it. But let's grant for the sake of argument that whether or not God exists is essentially unknowable. Like that is, we can't have certain proof one way or the other. That that's just not possible. Let's say that that's true. Even if it was true, there still is room for theology. There's still room to like discuss what does God mean? If this is true about him, what else would be true about him? Like what are we what's this thing we're talking about as like a theoretical entity? It's like a thing that we 
could have belief in um what are we just talking about that's that's still a metaphysical discussion and there's room for that even if we can't know whether god in fact exists or not we can still talk about that concept and, and what it would mean and, and the meaning of it so wanted to mention that to you guys need a little coffee here these are these lectures are so late eight o'clock is really whoo um all right the other thing I need to mention, and I want to apologize, I don't have a, a better whiteboard. This is the only whiteboard I have right now. Uh, you might be familiar with this uh, website, Quants. Um, this is probably my favorite webcomic of all time. Uh, every webcomic has the exact same panels of this thing and just different dialogue. So I might actually use this as a way of uh, drawing some things for us to talk about because there's a lot of drawing I like to do on the board. If you remember... We were, where we were at before, we had, let me get the little picture up here for us again. We were trying to understand A's in terms of B's. We got this notion of personal identity, and we want a theory for it. And we've got a bunch of pre-theoretical ideas about that concept. And we might be able to analyze a theory to recognize that it has certain um, things that are true of it. Like, if the theory is correct, then this would follow from that. It would mean that this would be true. It would mean that this would be true. The, the Basically, the consequences of this theory. And when these things don't add up, there's a problem that for the theory. That's not a good thing. That's, that just means that the theory is counterintuitive. It's not a fatal flaw, like we were saying this morning but still is a problem. And we're going to see how there's going to be some some issues here for the first theory that we're going to really uh, devote some attention to. Uh, the other thing that is that I wanted to talk about before we get into the actual proposals of these theories and what they're saying and how we defend them or attack them, there's some other piece of the puzzle about the, this sort of theoretic modeling of, of how we go about having these debates, that the, a piece of the picture that's missing. And that is... The motives that make us care about this idea in the first place and that make us concerned about having a deeper uh, philosophical analysis of this concept. And in the case of personal identity, for those of you guys who, uh, who have done the reading for the, the Perry thing, what's the thing that got, them, that got the figures in that story first talking about personal identity in the first place? Like why did they even bring that up? Why was there any kind of wonder or concern about whether I'm the same person or not. Can you say a little bit more there? Rob says imminent death. Can you say a little bit more? How, how would identity be relevant for death? Or why would that have to come up? So this question about survival, that's that's the one that first provokes the discussion in the Perry piece. Virib's body is about to die. It's imminently, um, imminently threatened. Uh, and um, there's a question, could she survive the death of her body? And if we're going to talk about survival, and remember, she says, I don't even need a proof that I will survive. She's like, I just want to know. What would it mean for me to survive? That's like what I was talking about at the very beginning of the lecture tonight, about this like difference between epistemology and metaphysics. It's not like whether we would know whether it's actually happening, but just what would it mean for it to happen? What's the possibility that we're talking about here with survival? And um, Veer brightly identifies how if we're going to talk about me surviving, then the thing that lives on needs to be the same as me. So I need to survive. In order for, for me to figure out whether or not I have survived, I need to know what's me, what are the conditions for my existence, um, and under what conditions would I be said to have uh, be that, that, that thing that's living on is still me or not. Remember when we were talking about uh, you, I die, you put me in the ground, and then a tree grows out of my like decomposing soil stuff? That's not going to be me. That tree is not me. Um, I did not survive. 
<laughs> and that's what um, uh, the figures in the story definitely, they talk about that same sort of thing, this like circle of life thing that we're a part of. And, and if that's the notion of survival that we're talking about, then that's not really survival. That's not me actually continuing to exist. Or take take the kind of um, way that people offer uh, condolences or or affirmation or support uh, in depth, where it's like we say something like, this person will live on in our memories or something like that. It's like, does that mean really that they survived? No. They're, that doesn't, that's like a, something kind of like survival, like the effects of their life are still being felt, that sort of thing, like the ripple effect of how their existence has changed reality. Well, there's still maybe ways in which that's happening, but they have not survived. The thing that is them has gone out of existence or something like that. Okay. Um, and as they bring it up uh, in the reading, there are some other perspectives that do talk about the possibility of survival uh, from the death of the body. But that doesn't necessarily mean the, the destruction of the person when the body is destroyed. Uh, Plato puts it this way. He talks about, in the Phaedo, he makes a really famous argument for the immortality of the soul. And Plato, Plato's sort of metaphor for this is that... Um, the, the body is like a, a jacket that when the jacket wears off, just discard it. Then it goes away. You can get another jacket. It's not about you. Like I'm when we were talking about identity this morning, I'm not the clothes that I wear. If I burn this shirt up and never have it available to wear again, that doesn't mean I'm a different object or something like that, that I like need to have this shirt for my survival, that this is intimately connected with my identity. Um, that's not really what's going on here. If this thing, if I, you know, take this shirt off, put on another one. I'm still the same person. It's not connected with me. Maybe the body is like that too. That if I shed this body and adopt that some other body, that I'm still, I've still survived. I still exist as the same person. That I still have that identity. Um, so that'll, that's, that's some of the backdrop here. There's always going to be, whenever we're having a theory, there's some sort of theoretical motivation. And this will be especially important when we get to Parfit and how Parfit's needs there's got to be some other frame of reference here for whether a theory is a good theory or a bad theory. It's, in other words, theories are not in themselves uh, just a matter of whether they are true or false simpliciter, especially when we're debating. Theories are usually about stuff that we don't have any direct evidence for. Um, they're like the construction that we put on the evidence that we have. What's the right way to make sense of it conceptually? Something like that. And there's always got to be some purpose. The fancy philosophy word for this is desiderata. And there's got to be something that holds our theories accountable, something that will, the standards of whether they're a good theory or not a good theory. Usually, most theories just have the very simple purpose of explaining, that they're supposed to explain. They're supposed to make it better for us, to, or easier or more reliable in the predictions that we're capable of making about reality and stuff like that, um, or to just be able to make tell some sensible story that helps us organize these range of experiences or thoughts or beliefs to make them all sort of sync up together. Um, in the case of our discussion of personal identity, uh, it seems as though any we have these questions about, say, um, survival, and like I brought up in class this morning, moral responsibility. There are these other sort of concepts that we trade in that are very important to our lives that seem to automatically invoke the notion of identity. So if we're going to get straight on these issues, we have to get straight on this issue first. That's the basic idea. That's the, the theoretical motivation for why we're even in this debate to begin with. So that's a little bit of the backdrop here. And then I, I want to start moving on uh, to the theories. But let's see here. Um, Alexa has a comment. Hmm. Okay, so Alexa brings up this idea that the concept of an afterlife might just be a way for people to feel better about themselves, to not be able to fear death, um, to like give some comfort or security. And that might be true. I mean, any time that we're putting together a theory and thinking about what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, there's always room for bias to get into the picture here. Um, certain things like I want to believe things that make me feel comfortable, that's always kind of a threat. I'd say the bigger ones are uh, sort of conceits related to the ego, like I want to be right or I want to be able to vindicate what is my initial gut reaction so I can continue to believe like I'm infallible even if that's kind of absurd. The ego is totally absurd. When it's actually exposed to the light, it never really makes sense. But it still gets into the picture, it still gets into the 
the machinery and gums the whole thing up. So we have to be careful about that. Definitely we want to have those like the potential for bias on the radar. But here's the big thing that I'd say is a, kind of a, a limit to that. We don't want to be putting so much attention on the possibility of bias that it keeps us from being charitable. And there's so many ways in which uh, theoretical options, especially when it comes to metaphysical stuff, that the, the positions that aren't the ones that we personally believe or the ones that we find plausible are dismissed as absurd. And we, or, and not just that the theory itself is absurd, but that the people who um, espouse these theories or who adopt them or who encourage other people to adopt them are doing something that has some like illegitimate ulterior motive, that they're not really, really true seekers, that they're just trying to make themselves feel good or whatever else, right? Um, and I think we have to be very, very careful and hesitate about accusations of bias, especially in, um, in, a, in a general sense, like saying that this whole theory's purpose is to make us feel better. I mean, we should probably look first at whether there's any serious arguments for whether we should think it's true before saying, jumping to some sort of other type of explanation for why people would believe it. We have to first look at what are the reasons that might justify the belief before we start asking the questions about just what would cause people to adopt it. That's my advice. Uh, maybe we could have some other kind of, that's a little tangent thing that maybe we could have a debate about some other time. But I wanted to say at least that much about it, that I really encourage out of anybody, um, whether you're new to philosophy or not, to really kind of hold the hold off on the like accusation or the um, these uh, different types of challenges that are more to have more to do with the motives behind why people would adopt a belief than about the uh, reasons for it. So when I'm talking about motives here, I'm not talking about motives like uh, to make me feel good or something like that. We're talking about theoretical motives that are related to truth seeking. Like, I need to be able to have an answer for how to understand this question or this aspect of reality. Uh, what's really going on with it? And that's, that gives me a motive to be concerned maybe about some other theoretical question or another reason. It's more like work that the theory can do in helping me get at the truth. That's a good way to think about it. Still, still has that kind of legitimate motive rather than something else entirely that has nothing to do with truth. Does that make sense? Oh man, I'm so in the habit of asking that question. I don't know if it's always the best thing for video chat chats, but uh, thank, thanks, Alex. Thanks for saying yes, um, giving me like a quick little response. Um, <laughs> I do too. I love this stuff too. Okay, so probably um, that's actually a really good transition into our first theory here, because the first theory that Birib and um, Miller and Cohen start talking about in their discussion is the soul theory. And probably you're thinking immediately that the soul theory is, uh, you know, maybe solely or only for people who are religious and that the only motives for even positing the soul theory in the first place would be some kind of religious motive. So our first analyzing A's in terms of B's that we're going to look at is maybe personal identity has to do with the soul, that that's what makes up personal identity. So being the same person is... Uh, means having the same soul. And yes, Miller is a chaplain, and yes, there is a connection with uh, religious thinking, but here's the thing that really must be explained. Um, the most prominent example of someone who espouses the soul theory, uh, especially around questions of identity and survival, is Plato. And Plato's not really religious in the way that we would recognize. Um, he was actually pretty dead set against the Greek religion of his time, and there is some sort of way in which sometimes people call him a monotheist, because he does talk about uh, the god instead of multiple gods, but really what he's, I think, referring to, I mean, oh, I know what he's referring to is really the form of the good, and how much he's putting some kind of anthropomorphized element into that, like whether the form of a good has a personality, whether it has any kind of thing that would be concerned about people, or that we would have like a relationship to the way like a person, whether whether the form of good has personhood or not is really um, up for debate. And I don't think the evidence really is in, a, in, its, in its favor. So I don't, I don't Plato is um, maybe exploring the spiritual path like other sort of religious traditions do, but he doesn't really got, buy into like a traditional religious 
uh, mindset or, or worldview or something like that. It's a little more um, abstract and intellectual for Plato. Uh, and he's the one who really espouses this soul view. Um, so, yeah, some people who have religious commitments might also be uh, committed to this theoretical entity of the soul. But for one thing, you don't have to, if you're religious, it doesn't mean you're going to buy into the soul theory of personal identity. It's not required. And it works the other way, too. If you buy into the soul theory as a way of explaining personal identity, that doesn't require you to be religious or something like this. All we're really talking about when we talk about a soul is that there's something other than what's physical. So we've got physical substances like these things. This is a physical substance. It has physical matter to it. There's something else. We might call it a spiritual substance or just a mental substance or something like that. But any view like this is committed to saying that there's some other type of existence other than physical things that exists alongside them and interacts with them. And we'll call that the soul. The soul is just uh, a collection of this kind of spiritual mental substance, that sort of thing. It's really, um, the, the soul theory is not that far away from Aristotle's theory about matter. So for material objects, remember we were saying in class this morning that what makes this pen the pen that it is and not this pen, if you imagine I had the identical pens, remember that sort of thing. This, this pen has its identity as an object based on the fact that it is a lump of stuff that's in this location as opposed to maybe one in some other location. Okay? So this, this has physical matter to it. And it's this collection of physical matter as opposed to something else. It's not about the properties of this object, like the fact that it has Expo written on it and it's a black pen and it's got a cap and the shape of it and all and the weight and all those sorts of things. The, that's about that qualitative identity stuff. And that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about numerical identity, the personal identity sort of idea. So Aristotle would say that what sets this thing's existence, what gives it its identity, is the lump of matter that it is. And if I manipulate this matter in certain ways, like I draw on it, or maybe I take my lighter and burn some of it, or melt it or something, it still is the same pen because it's the same collection of matter, of stuff. And, and Aristotle posited that if we're going to talk about there being a thing, which is the bearer of properties, then there, he, he's saying there has to be some sort of theoretical matter, which he called substratum. And substratum is very interesting because it doesn't have properties itself, but it's the bearer of properties. It's the physical matter that then, when it is arranged in certain forms, takes on certain properties. So that's Aristotle's story about material objects, and I think um, that more or less is how we think about it too, that there's there's some stuff here, and I can make some modifications to the stuff, um, but there is a thing that is the underlying bearer of these sorts of properties. Okay, so if we're talking about a soul, all we're talking about is the underlying substratum that is able to take on certain types of mental properties. Things like thoughts, uh, feelings, emotions, perceptions. Um, all the stuff that happens in our mental life is like different ways in which this mental substance is being formed and arranged in order to exhibit certain properties. Think about it like a bunch of like physical matter, like Play-Doh, that's being molded into different shapes in order to take on certain, certain properties. Um, so really, the notion of a soul is more of a it's, a, it's a really thin theoretical concept. It doesn't, it's not loaded with a lot of religious or spiritual baggage here. Um, it's just another way that we can think about how to make sense of the reality that we're confronted by. Um, the, the, the sort of inspiration for even talking about there being some other type of substance other than physical substance is that um, thoughts don't seem to work the way that physical objects do. Like physical objects, I can move around in space and stuff like that. How do I do that with my thought of a triangle or the flavor of peppermint ice cream or stuff like that? Like it doesn't, I can't manipulate the mental stuff the way that I can manipulate physical stuff. They seem to have very different causal properties about like what can influence them or cause them to arise and come into existence. It seems very, very different. Um, so there's the thought that maybe there's some like two fundamentally different types of realities here. There's consciousness and the mental world and then there are physical things um, so we've got mental substances and physical substances this is called dualism this kind of worldview this metaphysical ontology in other words 
this sort of picture of what we're saying exists in reality and what doesn't exist. To, to make room for two different types of fundamental substances, fundamental stuffs, mental stuff and physical stuff, that's dualism. And if you're going to talk about mental phenomenon happening, got to be some object in which those mental phenomenon is happening. We might call it a mind, but we're really just saying soul. Soul and mind, same thing. We're saying that there, uh, some, there's some other non-physical substance in which these mental phenomenon take place. So my best way of explaining this for the soul is what I call the soul bowl. So the soul, just like with Aristotle's physical substratum, a property list stuff that then properties inhere in, the soul is a propertyless mental substance that then is the bearer of mental properties. So you've got all these things in the bowl. There's all your thoughts and emotions and, and beliefs and perceptions and memories. And these things are always changing. Like there's new memories and thoughts coming in and I forget some old things or some aspects of my, my personality, my mental personality or my beliefs. I give up some beliefs. Those things can change. But the thing that's staying the same the whole time is the bull. And the soul theory is saying that what makes you the same person is having the same bull. Just like what makes this the same pen is that it's the same stuff. Even if I mutilate it and change its properties quite a bit, I would still say it's the same pen because it's the same matter. Same thing with a person. Even if they drastically change their beliefs, so they, maybe they get dementia and they lose a lot of their memories and stuff like that. I'm still the same person in as much as I have the same soul. So it's a, it's a propertyless substratum that then these mental episodes take place in. That's the basic idea. Um, I kind of want to pause for a second and see if you guys have some questions. I could, I could probably keep talking about this a little bit more, but I want to see how you guys are doing with it so far, if there's any questions. Uh, Alexa, it looks like I missed a comment from you. Would this include the fourth dimension? I can't remember what that was in reference to. Yeah, Daniel, go for it. I like that system. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> um, so this is obviously a more recent piece than Russell or Plato, right? Uh, the Perry? The, yeah, the whole the whole Perry, because the whole setting is in a hospital. So my thought is they're thinking of two things with there being physical matter and mental matter, but do they not consider electricity a property and electricity being a byproduct uh, or in relation to the mental state of just an interaction between neurons, is that not like a physical property? That is a physical property. That's exact. So what you might be speaking to, if you're going to say maybe consciousness or the mind has to do with these electrical sort of impulses that are happening in neurons, that's another model of how we could understand personal identity called materialism. And that's a competing theory with the soul theory. Materialism thinks there is no such thing as mental substances. It's all just matter all the way down. Um, they've got materialism has its own sorts of sets of problems. In the in the dialogue, materialism is the position that Virab is maintaining throughout the whole discussion. She's the materialist. She's like, I don't buy the soul theory. I don't buy the psychological continuity theory. I think I just am my body. That's what makes me me. Um, Materialism and they and sort of so it doesn't get its own like direct treatment, but materialism also has some problems. There are some objections that get talked about in Perry. One of the big ones is the one I just mentioned. Uh, if you're going to be a materialist, you have to explain how consciousness has this sort of these sort of properties that some, don't seem to play into a physical causal nexus. Uh, and one of the the ways that people most try to do it is kind of the model I think you might have in mind when you mention this thing about electricity. It's called Physicalism or physicalist reductionism that you want to reduce mental properties to just physical properties that are their cause or their physical instantiation. So when I think of the color red, there's just a certain pattern in my neurons, the electrical impulses in my neurons that are causing that. And that's all red is. The like experience of red, all that is, is just that brain state, that physical arrangement. That's not entirely plausible. Because the content of an experience may not be the same as the cause of that experience. 
And that's really the idea here is you're going to say, well, if I like was able to stimulate Tim's brain with these sort of electrical impulses, he would see the color red. We can do that. I can like manipulate his brain and cause certain experiences. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what my experience is about. That all red means is just certain you know neurons in my brain firing. Let, let's do it with pain. Pain, I think, is an easier example. Um, pain is caused by uh, C fibers, a certain uh, area of my brain. When those neurons are firing these C fiber things, that's the experience of pain. And it was really easy. That was one of the first things we were able to figure out in neuroscience. Of like, you know, pain's a pretty explicit experience, and figuring out what the neural correlate of it is is not that difficult. So we're able to do that. But it doesn't mean that when I'm experiencing pain, I'm like, oh, there's those C fibers firing. Like when people experienced pain uh, hundreds of years ago before we had neuroscience, it wasn't like they didn't have an experience with any kind of content because they couldn't figure it out. Or, or that sort of raises some absurdities. Like if that's what really what the experience was about, then wouldn't I be able to tell that it was C fibers when I had the experience? So it might, maybe there's something else going on here. And that, that's the problem. There's, there's a lot of uh, difficulties with this sort of reducing things to just their physical causes. Even dualism, even many forms of dualism, say physical uh, substances can cause mental episodes, that there's causal interrelations here. They've got their own theoretical difficulties because they have to explain how there could be causal relationships with two substances which are fundamentally different, right? If we're, if we're really going to say there are physical substances and mental substances, then how are they supposed to interact? That's a real crazy dilemma. So... All these theories have certain questions that they need to answer, um, and there isn't a kind of obvious answer about this. Uh, I, I think that's my real bottom line point here. Um, but what you're talking about is another option that's on the table, and it's called materialism. Yeah. The soul theory is not going for that, though. It might say, sure, I mean, when your soul enters into a certain body, there's going to be some physical signs, like what's going on in your brain. We don't have to deny that to talk about there being a mental substance. Just the same way that it's not like I have to pretend like it's some magical power that my soul is able to control my fingers and not talk about nerves or something like that, right? Like there's there's room for that. There's room for that under this uh, theoretical model of the soul. Okay, so Alexa was wondering whether the concept of a soul or an existence beyond what we usually perceive would have to do with the fourth dimension. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the fourth dimension, Alexa. Um, usually... I used to talk of the fourth dimension as just being time. Um, but do you have something else in mind there? It is time. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what these other dimensions would be. Maybe it'd be kind of like the way dualism wants to talk about things, where it's saying something like, well, there's the three dimensions that exist in space, and that's uh, dimensions for uh, physical objects, but mental objects don't exist in space. Like when I'm uh, holding different concepts or their relationships or something like that, Maybe there's a kind of space in which that's happening, but it's definitely not like physical three-dimensional space. Um, there's something, maybe there's some other thing going on, some other uh, level of reality. Um, and, that, and that is definitely what the material, or the, um, the dualist is committed to. By positing kind of these mental substances, uh, they do exist in time, but they don't maybe necessarily exist in space other than that they manifest within certain physical bodies, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, maybe a spirit dimension. I mean, here, here's the thing. Um, I think the soul theory gets a bad rap in the sense that it usually is considered as like the spooky theory, like the one that's kind of goofy and weird and that might have us like have to believe in wacky things. Um, but really, like I, this is what I was trying to show with the Aristotle example. Aristotle's notion of just there being a substratum in which phenomenon exists seems like a pretty straightforward uh, logical explanation. That, and that's really why the soul theory is the first one that gets talked about. 
because it really is the most straightforward, simple answer for what's going on. I'm experiencing mental phenomenon. That's not like physical stuff. There's got to be something that exists that it exists in. What is the container of my thoughts, the vessel of my thoughts? That's the soul. It's like nothing really spooky or woo-woo about it. Um, it's it I think is might be the more direct thing to do it. I think there's some maybe some weird cultural things going on here with uh, how like it's not the kind of thing that like I don't get to observe souls the way that I get to observe physical objects. So empirical science doesn't have a whole lot to say about the world of uh, consciousness uh, and it's working on that but it's really really at the baby stages I did a lot of work in cognitive science in grad school and it is a baby field uh, of science we, we people are trying to discuss about just what are the fundamental um, research projects even like what are we even concerned about or what does it mean to be a cognitive scientist what's your procedure or method of inquiry is really controversial and we don't know the first thing about the mind really um, it's all very, very speculative. Uh, we've got like um, fMRI scans and stuff like that, but those things aren't very suggestive about what's really going on with the mind. And there's increasingly um, skepticism that we could do something like map the brain at all, that the brain might be a little bit more of a plastic sort of thing uh, that doesn't have like little gears that this thing does this function and this thing does this function and so on and so forth. So there are there are realities that are getting talked about here, things that are being posited as existing and having their own dimensions or their own realms to existence. But really, that's the same thing that we're doing when we're talking about physical objects or making a scientific theory. Um, I think I've mentioned to you guys before string theory. It's one of my favorite examples, just because it's an area of science that is under heavy debate, and it's a it's a it makes the cutting edge of science is always. The best place for seeing the thing that's always going on in science, but we may not always recognize it, that when we put a scientific theory together, we're really positing a theoretical entity that is supposed to conform to the stuff that we can't observe in order to explain it as best we can. It's a conceptual modeling system. That's really what's going on. And strings are a perfect example because we can't observe these things directly. Some people just posit them as a way of explaining what we can observe, the way that uh, subatomic particles uh, behave what causes them to come into existence and all that sort of stuff. But like maybe there really aren't different types of fundamental particles. Maybe there's just one type of fundamental particle, a string, and it takes on different properties based on what, how much energy is in it, what wavelength it's vibrating at uh, because of how much energy it's charged with. That starts sounding pretty close to the substratum theory that Aristotle gave thousands of years ago, right? Fundamental stuff that just, it doesn't have any properties on its own. But when it's in certain forms, then it now exhibits different properties. So when the string is vibrating at a certain thing, it's an electron. When it's there here, it's a quark, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind here. All of these theories are positing some sort of existence, and um, the fact that it may not be the one, the model that you currently occupy with how what your worldview looks like, maybe is not a reason for thinking that it's totally nuts and crazy. Um, there's been a lot of transitions in how. Uh, scientists, philosophers, and just regular old people have thought about the universe. And sometimes those transitions are not because we've got more truth. <laughs> sometimes it's just that the culture changes. For example, uh, scientists used to love the concept of ether. That they're like, there's got to be some medium in which forces are capable of being transmitted over distances. And so they thought there isn't space, that there's really a fundamental ether stuff that things exist in. Um, and then that kind of way of thinking about physical sciences has fallen out of favor. And it's very, very rare that you're going to find someone talking about the ether. But then there's still sometimes the, these discussions of fields of force that start to sound a lot like this ether concept. And people are like, hey, maybe that concept wasn't so bad. Like, I liked that metaphor as a way of trying to explain physical phenomena. So this sort of relationship keeps going on and so on and so forth. Um, okay. Rob, what kind of smiley face is that? This is a regular smiley face? Let's say he has weird eyebrows. I'm not exactly sure if I got the message. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, um, so let's talk about some of the limitations of the soul theory. Um, so remember, what we're talking about, propertyless substratum, mental substratum, in which mental properties exist. So you aren't, according to the soul theory, you aren't your thoughts, beliefs, and experiences. 
you're the thing that's having thoughts, that's having beliefs, that's having experiences, that sort of thing. The, the thing that is the bearer of all of that, that's what you are. And as long as that is the same, you are the same. Uh, lots of beliefs and personality things, drastic changes can happen to the contents of the bull. But as long as the bull is the same, you're the same. And the bull itself is property-less. It's not like the, the soul theory is not this v vision of like everyone has this own kind of unique character to their soul. There's no personality to the soul. Uh, personality is just one of the things that the soul can be like turned into one shape versus another shape. There isn't an essential character to a person. Um, according to the, maybe you believe that, but that's not what the soul theory is saying. The soul theory is just saying, here's a property list, something that then mental properties in here. Okay. So are we good so far on that? Just what the theory is. Cool. All right. Awesome. Let's talk about uh, some of the problems here. So, um, most of the time, a soul theory is going to be uh, offered as part of dualism, the, the metaphysical belief that there are physical substances and mental substances existing alongside each other, and that in a person, these things are combined. So, like, I have a body and a soul. The soul is essential to what I am, according to the soul theory, but the body is not. So, if my body dies, as long as my soul continues to exist, I have survived the death of my body, I still exist, because that's me. As long as the soul is still there, I still am there, because it is me. That's what my identity consists in, according to the soul theory. Okay, now, um, there's a question here, uh, and there's a kind of a classic argument uh, that gets offered. It's called um, reductio ad absurdum. Maybe you've heard of this style of arguing before. Uh, the way reductio works is it says, it kind of uses this strategy. It says, so I'm like talking to my opponent here. I say, opponent, let's say your your position is correct. I'm going to grant for the sake of argument that your theory is correct. Um, if your theory is correct, then it's going to result in this, that, and the other thing. And those things are absurd. They can't possibly be true. Therefore, your theory must be wrong. So if your theory entails some kind of absurdity, if granting that it's true generates some kind of absurdity or worse yet, a contradiction, then we know the theory is false. Certainly if there's a contradiction, because contradictions can't be true. You can't have something both true and false at the same time. Most basic principle of logic, if you want to debate that with me sometime, feel free. Good luck, because uh, it's pretty hard to argue against the rule of non-contradiction. And most of the time, the efforts I've seen where people are like, no, something can be true and false at the same time, they're really equivocating between the things that the thing that they're saying is true and false at the same time. They're really talking about two different things one, that are both true, something like that. So most paradoxes are actually just apparent paradoxes. There are some real paradoxes that we might wonder about, but most of them are not. Uh, what are you talking about? What do you mean dark matter? It goes against the principles of uh, physics that we've established. That's not a paradox, though. That just means that maybe our current theories are false because they just don't fit with the data. So I wouldn't to try and play devil's advocate there. You beat me. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of the things are, are things like, uh, um, oh, I don't know. Like what we're trying to imagine is like, could there be a red car that's not red? That'd be like a contradiction, like a straight up contradiction. Can that happen? Um, and the idea is basically no. Uh, and if it turns out that it, it could, that something could be both true and false at the same time, uh, then pretty much all reasoning falls apart. And everything, in fact, uh, it might be the case that all meaning is falls apart as well. Because if I'm making a claim, the meaning of my claim is saying that this is happening and not this. But if this could be true and false at the same time, then I'm not really making any distinction at all. So I'm really saying nothing. There's like no information that my words are providing. So without the law of non-contradiction, it might render all thought unintelligible. That would be an absurd answer. Lawrence is wondering what is uh, what counts as absurdity. One of the basic ways is just counterintuitive. So remember how I was saying that when a theory entails certain things that go against our pre-theoretical intuitions about the phenomenon that it's supposed to explain 
then that's a problem for the theory. That's what we're talking about here. And in Birab's argument against the soul theory, that's exactly what's happening. She wants to say basically this. Let me give you guys the argument again in case you need a reminder or we just need to explain it. Um, Birab thinks that uh, personal identity is the sort of thing that we can make judgments about. And in a common sense sort of way, Virab seems exactly right on this point. Um, I'm tracking your guys' attendance in class and grades. It seems like I'm in a good position to do that, that I'm not overstepping the boundaries of what I'm capable of knowing by recognizing that Daniel, the person I'm seeing in this video chat right now, is the same Daniel that I saw this morning in class. That, like, I can know that. That's within the realm of what is knowable for me. So the intuition is that we can have knowledge about personal identity. Maybe not in every case, but in many cases, or at least some cases, right? That I, this is possible. It's just possible to have that knowledge. But Virab says, take a look at the soul theory. If identity was a matter of souls, souls are by definition the things that we can't perceive. They are propertyless. There's nothing to detect in them. I can't figure out, you know, it's not like, you know, every soul is unique. That is a part of the theory. So maybe this is soul bowl number uh, 4,685, but I don't like get to see the serial number or something. Even when I look at my own soul, I'm not like, what soul do I have? Oh yeah, it's that one, right? And I don't get to see that when I look at Daniel. I'm not like, oh, I can see your soul. It's this very particular one. I can't do that. So uh, here's a problem. If the soul theory is correct, then that entails that we can have no knowledge of people's identity. Its identity becomes a kind of thing that's outside the boundaries of what we can know. That in itself is not a problem for the theory. The fact that it, it entails that we can't have knowledge about identity, not a problem. That's what I was talking about at the very beginning of this lecture tonight. But it is a problem in as much as we have an intuition that we can have knowledge about souls. So it seems like this, if this is a theory of personal identity, it's getting things wrong. It's absurd in the sense that it goes against what we believe as a matter of common sense and intuition about what this concept is and how it works. The theory isn't fitting the thing that it's supposed to be describing. And that's a, that's a theoretical dilemma for the soul theory. Um, how, can, how can we get this? So in its kind of formal structure here, I've got it, I'll get it written up here in my lecture notes. Uh, here's how Virab's argument would go through in terms of premises and conclusion. One, we make judgments about identity. Two, those judgments are not meaningless. In other words, they're intelligible, and we can have knowledge about them. Three, if identity was of souls, in other words, if the soul theory is correct, then those judgments would be meaningless because they would be groundless. There's no way for me to understand whether you have the same soul or not. There's no way for me to detect or perceive that. Therefore, identity can't be of souls. That's the basic idea. And that, that, this kind of style of, of reasoning, especially about philosophical, uh, theoretical matters, that's very, very common. And you'll see that kind of thing happening all the time. Um, like I said this morning in class, this isn't a fatal knockdown blow to the theory. It just sets up a burden of proof, an obstacle for it that it's going to have to deal with. It's going to have to either say, well, okay, there's some way in which the soul theory can explain how we can make judgments of identity, or... It has to bite the bullet and say, well, the intuition is wrong. We think we can know things about identity, but we really can't. And I think in the case of the soul theory, it is going to be a mix of both. Um, let's look at what Miller does in the, in the first night discussion. What is his response to this objection? Do you guys know, um, do you guys, do you guys know off the top of your head? A little quiz? Maybe that's also something I can't do in these video lectures. I do that a lot in class, though. One more time. What's the question? Uh, I'm I'm not gonna fish. We're we're probably running short on time anyway. Um, Miller thinks actually the soul theory can be saved here because he thinks there is a way for us to reason intelligibly about people's identity, even with identity being about souls, and even with us not being able to have knowledge about souls. And he says, I reason from the principle, same body, same soul. Why? Because of myself. I'm familiar with my own soul. I know I'm the same person. I have the same body. Every day, wake up, take a shower, same body, right? Put on clothes, boom, same body. So I think, well, you're a lot like me. 
I don't have any reason for thinking you're a fundamentally different type of entity. So what goes for me goes for you. And that is pretty reasonable in this case. This kind of argument from analogy seems pretty, pretty okay. Uh, if it was some kind of weird alien species, then maybe, you know, that we're totally unfamiliar with, then maybe the bets are off and the jury's still out and we'd have to figure that out. But at least in the case of us, this seems pretty reasonable. This is the same sort of thing uh, that I use to make the judgment that you have a mind, which seems like a very reasonable judgment. I can't see that you have consciousness directly. I don't perceive that. I don't look at Daniel's little picture there in the video chat and think, hey, there's a mind in there like mine. I can't see it. All I see is this little body wag going wagging around and putting a this, right? That's all I get to see. I don't see the consciousness or perceive it directly. But it sure seems reasonable for me to be like, hmm, Daniel has a body that looks a lot like mine. I know I have a mind. That's pretty clear to me. That's about the most transparent thing about my existence is that I have a mind. So I think he does too. And that's the same thing here. That like, I've got a soul. I'm the same person. But therefore, uh, uh, you do too. You, uh, I can reason with this principle. When I see the same body, I'm going to think it's the same person. Daniel, you say fired? What does that mean? Hello? Daniel? Sorry, no. I was responding oh, to oh, Josiah oh. there. Oh, I understand. You're having a, okay, I see. <laughs> um, okay, so that seems like a way to, to get things going here. Um, for example, uh, in the reading, or the example that they use in the reading is a box of chocolates. So remember when he's like, I pick up this chocolate. Why'd you pick up this chocolate? Because it's caramel and I like caramel. How'd you know it was caramel? Well, I've had these chocolates before and the ones that have the little swirl on them, those are the caramel ones. So I don't have to see the caramel. I can just see the swirl and I can infer that there's caramel inside. Same way that I can be like, that's the same body down there that I'm seeing with Daniel. So that means same soul same person. Maybe I can reason this way. But here's where Vera brings up another objection. So here's here's another problem. Um, what entitles me to the same body, same soul principle? How do I know? How do I know that I have the same soul? And to illustrate how we don't have knowledge about this, uh, Vera says, um, imagine these different possibilities about what could be happening right now. And notice how we can't detect the difference. There wouldn't be any difference to it. Um, let's say uh, I have the same body or the same soul throughout the entire life of this body. So that maybe that's what we generally think would be true. So that's one possibility. But there's some more. Let's say just this is a theoretical thought experiment, just a positing thing. Okay, we're not. This isn't dependent in any belief on God. But let's just say there is a God, and let's just so that there's a thing that has the power to do this. Um, and this thing is swapping out my, my soul um, once every 20 years. So every 20 years, takes all the stuff that's in this bowl and dumps it in another bowl. Same body, just swapped out the bowls. Whoop, whoop. Seems like this is possible. We're, we're using God here because he's omnipotent, so he can do everything, right? So if there's something that exists in reality, he can manipulate. We can imagine this as just a logical possibility, that some force or other or some phenomenon causes souls to get swapped and there's no loss of content so same thoughts beliefs feelings experiences blah 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 same body all that stuff's the same but different soul it's it's soul number um 4686 this time right every 20 years there's a little switch okay it'd be totally undetectable it wouldn't make any difference at all right um another version is that let's say the bowls are getting swapped out every five minutes or continuously. All of these things are pretty much roughly equivalent. So there's no way for me to tell whether even I have the same soul. On what basis am I supposed to make that judgment about myself? If I'm going to use it as a general principle to just say same body, same soul, what justifies me using it in even my case? I can't do that. There's no grounds for that. So again, it's not as simple. Verb's objection is not as simple as the soul is unknowable, therefore it's a bad theory. That's not how this works. Is that the unknowability of the soul poses certain problems because of the context of everything else that we care about theoretically for this debate. Okay, that's the real big issue here. Um, that uh, the soul theory is going to entail some absurdities about what it would mean to be the same person or ability to have knowledge about that at all.
uh, basically, I'd say at the point at which the discussion is left um, in the Perry piece, the soul theory is basically facing uh, a lot of objection here. That uh, at the, as it stands, the major problem is that the soul theory doesn't let us have any knowledge at all about identity. That in order to adopt the soul theory, we'd have to give up on any ambition of being able to know about identity. That doesn't mean the theory is wrong. And there's still some other things that motivate us theoretically about why we might buy into a model like that, even with the problem about us not being able to have knowledge about identity as a result. The basic plausibility of their being like, well, there's these mental phenomenon, and there's got to be something that they exist in. There's problems for thinking about physical substratum, uh, philosophical issues with this. But it's kind of like those philosophical issues don't worry us too much. Um, because it just seems so basic that I'm like, there's got to be some reality here that is the bearer of all this stuff, all the properties. There's got to be a stuff that's the bearer of the properties. We might think that that's enough, too, when it comes to the mind. Um, so the soul theory is not I, – I don't want to make it look like uh, – like I think sometimes people look at the arguments in, in Perry when I've taught this before, and they're like, well, that dealt with that theory. That theory's crazy. Done. What's the next one? But really, it's not, it's not, uh, that's a little too simplistic about how to see it. That the theory's got its work cut out for it in some respects, but it still has a lot of other pl plausibility in other regards, too. But there are some other options. And certainly in a debate like this, if there's another theory on offer that doesn't have the same problems and it has all the same benefits, then that will be the one that's more rationally defendable and more rationally preferable. So that is probably the biggest problem for the soul theory is that there might be some better alternatives. And there's one in particular that uh, we're going to have to talk about next uh, that has become very, very popular. Um, materialism is also a pretty popular option just because, I don't know, for the past, well, really for the past century, materialism has been very popular in Western analytic philosophy. Not so much in Western continental philosophy, and I wouldn't say so much in Eastern philosophy either, uh, but certainly in the analytic community materialism has be and physicalism in general, which is just a belief that the only things that exist in reality are physical substances. That's been a little more popular. Um, certainly not proven, and definitely not uncontroversial, but just a little more popular. Um, there's Philosophy has phases, and it'll go through more phases. That's what always happens. The, you study the history of it, it's like there's different fads from moment to moment. Um, you don't see the need to separate them, Daniel? What's the, the them that you're referring to? materialism and the view of the soul i mean when i speak of materialism as the soul and the identity being a, a series of electrical impulses and neurons i mean i don't think that necessarily counts out the idea that there has to be a soul or materialism why can't they both be one intertwined theory that the soul is like the page and the materialism is like the imprint and it can leave that imprint throughout life and then travel on as a soul, you know. I don't see the need. Then that wouldn't to... be materialism. That would be dualism, because you're saying there are still these two fundamental realities, right? Yes and no, because there it's not necessarily dual realities. It's just explainable. The one is explainable as a separate one. I don't even know how to word it. I mean, it could be like the reduction, right? You're like, we can still talk about spiritual stuff, but what we're really talking about is just physical phenomenon, that sort of thing. Yes, physical phenomenon, okay. exactly. That is materialism, and it. I think it would be wrong for it for that for a materialist to say, "Well, look, I've really got all the benefits of dualism here. It really is dualism, because that that's kind of it's dualism only, maybe in language only. That you're like, I can use the language of dualism, but the meaning is not really there anymore. So just one more quick question so yeah. in the soul and dualism are they pretty much proposing that you know say like we said earlier you have a major brain injury and the soul and the body is alive does they are they trying to propose that the soul has already moved on the body is alive but the soul is now gone it's moved on and now you're just left with an empty shell that's pretty much functioning on physical properties it's certainly possible for us to imagine quote unquote zombies that is a physical body that is that is functioning in some sort of way, like the physical uh, things required for life. Like there's blood pumping through the veins, there's electrical power that's like transmitting through the nerves, 
maybe it's capable of autonomous movement and stuff like that. But maybe there's there's no one behind the curtain. There's no one in the driver's seat. Because that's what I got from Parfit when I read it, is that's kind of what he was theorizing would happen in that situation. Well, we'll talk about Parfit later. He's his own kind of can of worms. I don't think he has that idea going on, though, um, of, like, there, there's no driver. When he's talking about there being no identity, he's got a very different notion in mind than that. Um, but we're talking about, like, there's no consciousness. That's a zombie. It's a body with no mind, no consciousness. Maybe that kind of thing can happen for the soul theory, but the soul theory is not required at making any kind of commitments or speculations or predictions about what's possible with respect to souls, like what are their causal parameters or something like that. That's a separate thing. The same way that the physicalist, the materialist, is not committed to making any claims about what are the laws, the physical laws of reality in saying just, in just defending the claim that all of reality is physical. Um, okay, I, we're, we got to wrap up the lecture tonight. I'm kind of sad to do that, but uh, this is a good stopping point because we got through the soul theory and we got to talk about some of the problems and, and the possible responses here uh, and this basic idea of argue, argument ad absurdum. But I want to leave you guys with a brief description of the second, uh, the second theoretical proposal that we're going to have to talk about on Wednesday. And it's looking more and more to me like uh, Wednesday's video lecture might also need to be on Perry. Maybe we'll be able to get started with Parfit, but uh, we'll see. This, you know, I was telling you guys that when I do this class uh, in class, when I do 101 as a daily thing, um, I'm very much like, we'll play it by ear. Like the schedule's flexible because I don't want to rush things when there's not really any understanding happening quite yet, or there's still some pe some major pieces to put together, even if we haven't done everything. Um, so I want to still try to experiment with that with you guys and see if we can't stay moderately flexible about things. Um, especially with this first topic, this is kind of our first getting into doing some real philosophy, so I don't want to rush it too much. I want to, I want it to be a good, solid experience uh, where you guys can track what's happening as we're moving through it pretty well. So I'm going to be patient about it. We'll see what happens. That's my, that's the gist, I guess. Oh, also, let's do a code word. Um, and uh, out of honor for my uh, my buddies from Quants, let's do T Rex. T Rex is the code word for tonight. Boom. Okay, um, so the second uh, the second theory that we got to talk about is the well, I guess we talked about the materialism theory. So that's just the idea that the bo the body is the basis of identity. So, um, <clears throat> um, oh, thanks, Josiah. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, so the, with materialism, it's basically saying same body, same person. Body's dead, you're gone. That's it. Body's destroyed, you're destroyed, because they're the same thing. That's what identity consists in, is your body, um, not a soul or something else. So that's the materialism option. But the other one is this theory of psychological continuity, or it's sometimes called the Lockean theory, or maybe the memory theory. It goes by a bunch of different names here. But the basic idea here is that identity is not like a thing. There's not a property that a being possesses in order to be the same thing. The way that we had it with the soul or or with the body, right? That it's like same body, same person, same soul, same person. The psychological continuity theory is doing it a little different. It's saying you're the same person as long as there's a continuous stream of consciousness. An unbroken chain of consciousness means that these things are the same person. If there's a break or something, then you're not the same person. But as long as it's continuous, you're the same person. Um, it's not about some kind of substratum. It's more um, like the kind of analogies that they use to explain this concept of identity uh, in the reading have to do with things like baseball games and rivers. Um, the baseball game and the river, these are the kinds of objects or entities that exist that don't have some underlying substratum. The river is like water flowing, right? But it's never the same water. It's not like the same stuff. The identity of a river is a little different. Um, it's, it's some kind of like continuous thing, a phenomenon, a continuous phenomenon that's occurring over a stretch of space. And the same thing with a baseball game. A baseball game could get interrupted. Like maybe uh, the, it starts getting rained out, and so they postpone it, and then they pick it up on a different day, day, and then we're like, that's really the same game. 
it's really the same game, even though the balls are all different, maybe it's played at a different location, um, there's still some continuity here with the game, um, and that would be the identity of the game. And maybe a person is like this too. Um, Parfit is talking about a, basically a variation on the psychological continuity model. And he's certainly engaging with the problems with the theory, which he's going to try to fix. And we, I can't talk about the problems tonight, but that's the basic idea with the psychological continuity theory. There's some more details to it, but I wanted to kind of alert you guys right off the bat before we get together on Wednesday <clears throat> that the game is a little different here with the psychological continuity theory. It's not it's not going to be a kind of substratum-y thing the way that materialism and the soul theory were both offering. It's a different type of thing entirely. And it's more about these psychological connections of the continuation of consciousness. And the interesting thing about the psychological continuity theory is that it really has no commitments about this whole materialism versus dualism sort of debate. They're like, we don't care what consciousness consists in. You think it's a physical reduction sort of thing? Whatever. Maybe it's not. Maybe it can't be reduced. So it is something on its own. Doesn't matter either way. As long as there's a continuation, an unbroken chain of consciousness, then you are the same person. That's what it's going to be about. So we'll talk more about that on Wednesday. Um, do you guys have any last minute questions or things you want to talk about from tonight's lecture before we log off? No text box for the code word. I'll check that out after we're done here. <laughs> cool. You're welcome, Lawrence. Thank you for showing up. I love having you guys here. And you can do more interrupting. There wasn't as much interrupting tonight. I would love that. I like that stuff. No, I thought I'd leave the video running right now and, and entertain any questions you guys had. Nope. Nothing that you want to get on the video? Okay. Well, good night, everyone. I'll see you on Wednesday. Um...